the um, so uh, first one sentence of thank you very much for for those of you who are here. Um, this is a um, an impromptu um, um, well visit by <laughs> Romina, who's um, quite far away right now. But um, uh, we we just want to. Uh, uh, hear a few words in the beginning about the project that, that she's working on, and then um, uh, also what the current situation is, because, you know, the media are very fickle. Um, as soon as um, something else comes up, um, a, um, a situation is completely neglected elsewhere. So you, you only get, um, you, you're usually left, left with the worst impression, and then uh, this is what people remember. Although, of course, situations develop all the time. So now we can... Um, uh, have you perhaps as the reporter on the ground and um, um, please say a few words about your project about the people who are funding you as well and then also the um, um, the, the situation that you're in. Well, thank you Lars for setting this up. As I said, I understood there would be a chat between the two of us, so this is a last minute thing, so apologies we didn't give you enough notice to the participants and attendees and everyone who watched the video afterwards. I see York. Hello, York, my former supervisor. <laughs> and I see John Newton, a very good friend of mine as well, and a few other people. <laughs> Hi, John Bins as well. <laughs> Too many jumps. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I, I appreciate that, that you put this together and um, giving me the platform to speak. Uh, I have put together a presentation because I do have most of the material which I use in multiple uh, occasions lately. Just I want to make a disclaimer. I have been speaking in Amharic literally every day for the past, I don't know how many months, and I can't pronounce English. So apologies if my English is just, you know, my pronunciation is over the moon. <laughs> Just, just a disclaimer. Um, so let me just share my slides, if that's okay. Uh, could you just make me the host, Lars, uh, and I, I'll, I'll share those. And then you can both see my slides and, and me. I believe you can both see, um, you can see both screens. I wouldn't say I'm a reporter. Uh, as I said, I'm not in Tigray. I haven't traveled to Tigray because I'm following university policy and I try to not put myself in risk where our university wouldn't cover me. Uh, and um, most of my communication has been with partners in Tigray, our two main partners in the Kali Maksum through the phone, and some of the representatives were able to travel to Addis Ababa a few weeks ago. So I have, you know, direct testimonies for them as well. Um, but the kind of, um, I guess, accounts I will speak about are primarily ar around the project. Uh, this, this, as we all know, is a controversial and sensitive topic. Uh, and I, I'm very aware of the fact that, uh, you know, not everyone is willing to speak about these issues currently, and I don't want to, to expose anyone. Uh, but I, I, I'd like to say a few things uh, on behalf of the project, what we are doing, and also um, Integrate as we hear it from the humanitarian aid of being in most of the PMCP child protection um, response. So I get very, very uh, regular, up, many regular updates about the situation. Uh, so I'll, I'll, sh I'll share some of that with you today. Um, and, uh, and then you can ask questions and we can have a chat perhaps and, and you know, a more conversational uh, style. So let oh. me just share the screen. Yes. I'm still unable. Uh, oh. I'm still I, I bet I, I did enable you. <laughs> Wait one second. Um, uh, actually, you should. Let me. Now. Oh, I can do it now. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Let me just get you to the first slide. I think you have already seen my slides. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So I have titled this very casually a talk on the crisis in Tigray presenting the results of a literature review on war violence and domestic violence by Project Dildo to inform humanitarian responses in the region. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain what, what you know, uh, my focus really is, is on, a, on a recent working paper that we released, uh, which looked at the current forms of war-related violence in the region and the relationship to domestic violence, which is the topic and the issue that we work on in Tigray and other areas of Ethiopia currently. Uh, and uh, uh, I will um, try to explain how this working paper might be used to the humanitarian response currently in the region. 
I put a photo here. It's from Aksum when I was last there, of course, uh, in peacetime. Uh, this was an interview with a soldier I did in, in, in their compound. Um, and, you know, at the time, uh, again, mo most households don't have weapons. This, this is just an exception, uh, as, as this, this was a guard. So what I will do today is uh, I, I had the idea to, to launch this working paper with the Orthodox media platform, uh, the OCP, uh, the Pan-Orthodox uh, media platform. And when we were discussing this event, uh, we thought of five questions really uh, that we would try to address in that launch event. And then Lars, since you set this up, we thought, why don't we merge the two into one and, and you know, use this occasion really to, to do the launch as well. So the five questions we had in mind is first is, uh, you know, uh, 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 saying a bit about the project and what we do, uh, explaining the motivations behind the work and how this relates to the current crisis, the aims of the literature review context, um, and how we see, you know, the insights of the working paper uh, informing the current humanitarian response. And then perhaps a more um, a exploratory question, you know, given the theology driven nature of our project, how would we say uh, can Christian Orthodox believers and really the international community support fellow Tigrayans in this time. So I will try to follow these five questions in my presentation. Uh, I hope uh, I will not take more than 30 minutes, but um, I'll try not to rush as well. Um, so Project Dildo, very briefly, is a research and innovation project uh, which is dedicated to the development and, and strengthening of countries, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and the UK. Uh, our, it, it, it's motivated um, uh, from previous research that uh, was conducted in, in the northern region of Ethiopia, in Tigray, in Aksum. And uh, that evidenced, you know, the crucial role of religious tradition, religious beliefs, and the clergy in particular in, in uh, everyday life, but also in married life and the experience of conjugal abuse specifically. Um, so the current project builds on this evidence and aims to increase our understanding around the influence of religious beliefs, theology, and the clergy, uh, more specifically in domestic violence, and, and to... Uh, improve awareness in society, but also in the government sector uh, about the influence of religious cultural parameters in domestic violence, and especially in the attitudes and the help seeking responses of uh, perpetrators and victims respectively. Uh, and the project expands also in Eritrea uh, in the UK, uh, so it's not exclusive to Ethiopia. Uh, what we would like to do is to reverse knowledge transfer essentially. Uh, which has been typically, uh, you know, uh, uh, Western, you know, typically Western knowledge is applied in what we call low and middle income countries. Uh, what, we've what we are trying to do is uh, take a decolonial approach and, uh, you know, use knowledge and evidence that we produce in Ethiopia and Eritrea around domestic violence in order to inf inform also debates and approaches in the UK domestic violence sector which increasingly caters to migrant and ethnic uh, my, diverse ethnic minority communities including Ethiopians and Eritreans living in the UK. So we hope uh, not only to um, you know prioritize the community's own understandings and normative frameworks and religious cultural traditions and exegetical traditions so pay attention to theology uh, but also change the way knowledge is produced and disseminated and shared. So we, we, we aim at a more equitable um, uh, knowledge production and sharing between the three project countries and more internationally. Um, it's, uh, you can see the funders. This is uh, uh, funded by UKRI, for full, supported with funding by the Harry Frankel Gangham Foundation. Uh, uh, something about uh, the, the, the name of the project, Dildo. Dildo is uh, a Tigrinya word and means bridge. Dildo in Amharic. And what we aim to do, which is to bridge different discipline sectors and stakeholders, including international development, religious, religious studies, public health, in order to achieve you know, a more integrated, um, reflexive and essentially effective uh, approach to addressing domestic violence in diverse religious cultural contexts. Um, as I said, it's based on previous research and, and, and many years of uh, friendship and collaborations and discussions with uh, colleagues uh, in Aksum, Mekale and uh, Addis Ababa. So you can see the partners currently. Uh, of course, 
as I will say, uh, we have limited communication with Aksum University currently and the same for mentions Abakasad uh, Barhane Theological College, which are two of our initial and main partners. Uh, we have more communication currently with Ethiopian Women Lawyers Association who are based in Addis and a new partner, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church Development and Interchange Aid Commission, which is the development wing of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahara Church here in, here in Ethiopia. Um, and also UK-based and Eritrean partners, as you can see. Uh, so just to uh, break a bit the monotony and before I go into the current situation, I just wanted to share a few photos from Tigray uh, that I collected throughout the years of uh, my research and, and relationship with the region. Um, and I just wanted to you know, share a bit on what Tigray looked like before this conflict and the distractions that are happening as we speak. Uh, is one of the most peaceful regions I have visited personally, and, and I truly appreciate the hospitability of the, of the people and, again, the, the, the calm rhythm of the life, of the local life, especially in the countryside. Um, this is a church uh, in, uh, inside a monastery in the village where I conducted uh, a six-month-long uh, six research uh, around Aksum, in the countryside around Aksum. Uh, is called in Lailo Macho Woreda, if for those who know. Um, this is the, um, uh, the church of uh, Mary of Zion, Maria Mission in Aksum, the very famous church uh, where reportedly a massacre took place. Uh, and uh, uh, reportedly, uh, I, I don't mean just the newspapers, but I mean also reports that I hear from friends and colleagues I have in Aksum. Uh, this is another photo from Tenkat, Theophany. Uh, this, I believe, was in Azbi Wamberta Woreda in Tigray, 2012. Uh, as you see, a very, uh, you know, strongly religious region, uh, as I will discuss. Uh, and another photo from a, a village marriage, which I attended, again, during my anthrop anthropological research in 2017, 2016-2017. So, um, just very quickly, I just, I, I wanted to, um, discuss a bit impact because this is an impact-led project and uh, we respond directly to um, problematic understandings of impact in international development which have tended to be eurocentric pro programmatic or short-sighted uh, really top-down understandings uh, determined by donor priorities so we, we aim to depart from that and and our, our main premise and, and objective really is to uh, work in a meaningful way uh, and to develop impactful interventions that are built from the ground up, informed, as I said, by rigorous research that is reflexive and ethnographic, ethnographic and based on uh, the accounts of, of the people themselves. Um, so language and uh, you know, linguistic abilities is key in this, in, in this project. Uh, but also we aim to, in, in order to achieve this, we aim to use sustainable and dialogical strategies throughout, such as, uh, you know, really, uh, using, um, building on existing infrastructures and systems uh, of domestic violence in order to avoid duplication. So we're not bringing something new. We're trying to really function as a bridge, connecting existing initiatives, national or, or non-governmental. We try to broker across sectors and, uh, and, and uh, stakeholders in order to raise awareness around uh, the complexity of domestic violence in the religious society. Um, and then we, we also aim to, you know, our methods and our research approaches aim to be, again, uh, reflexive and people-centered at all times, mostly ethnographic participatory, and again, uh, in the languages of the local communities, uh, and building on knowledge that, that communities themselves hold and uh, their own understandings as much as possible. Uh, and, and just to concretize a bit our work, uh, so in Ethiopia we planned three, we have three main components really, which is research interventions and public engagement or knowledge exchange. Uh, in terms of research, we aim to build on the previous research and uh, we are looking to conduct more interviews and um, surveys with men in particular to understand how uh, their religious uh, beliefs and socialization informs their domestic violence attitudes. Uh, and how that can then inform deterrence uh, treatment programs for perp perpetrators, uh, but also other interventions in the community. We also want to conduct more research with, with victims and survivors of domestic violence, uh, primarily through EULA, clients uh, that EULA supports. Again, to explore how faith uh, might be conducive in coping mechanisms, which is something that was emerged in the previous research. 
Uh, and we are exploring the possibility of developing a faith-based perpetrator treatment program here in Ethiopia uh, in later years. Of course, the research component have been put um, sort of <laughs> postponed for now because we were trying to adapt the project in the early months, uh, and I can discuss this later. Now we are looking primarily on the intervention and public engagement component. The intervention is comprised primarily of workshops with clergy, which include theological, ethnographic, and safeguarding content around domestic violence. And the aim is really to help the clergy understand the problem better, their role in, in sometimes contributing to the problem, but also in how they become they can become the solution or part of the solution, actually. Um, we also aim to hold trainings, very soon trainings with secular providers, again, to raise awareness, to share this research, uh, the results and the evidence, and to raise awareness, uh, and to help them understand how they can engage better with religious stakeholders and parameters in domestic violence um, approaches and interventions. And our key priority and activity in the past five months has been really uh, on publishing working papers that are relevant, uh, disseminating the research, deliver, uh, organizing and delivering we webinars around uh, you know, um, relevant themes and public engagements. Um, and, and again, this, this has been one of the most sort of resourceful ways that we could um, uh, become useful in this time for Ethiopia as we were trying to adapt the project and to understand what is possible and what is not possible in terms of research activities. So uh, the project started 1st of November, uh, which is quite um, ironic, I guess, because the conflict started on the 3rd of November or 4th of November. Um, so so planning to travel to Ethiopia, to Addis Ababa. And so uh, immediately all communications with the region were interrupted. Uh, so we were in, unable to even ascertain the well-being of our colleagues. Uh, and of course, we couldn't continue the, the collaboration with the main two ins partner institutions in Ethiopia, which are Aksum University and the St. Fomentius Theological College in Mekale. Um, and, and as we were sort of responding to this and, and the shock, uh, we were thinking, how can we make the project useful? Uh, and you know what does this mean for the project? Because the project again is built is very much based on evidence that was produced in Tigray, which we then wanted to explore, uh, you know, to apply to other regions of Ethiopia. But Tigray was our pilot area, um, and we also wanted to know uh, to make ourselves useful. How, how can we contribute to, you know, not just peace building or reconciliation uh, in the long run, but also immediately? How can we support you know the victims of violence um so the region uh and and to pay attention you know to the conflict and how co the conflict you know what the conflict would imply for family relations for domestic life you know for the conflict affected communities as a whole and we also wanted to produce some guidelines for the humanitarian agencies. We anticipated that there would be, you know, a humanitarian response. And we know the problems within the humanitarian sector, which, like the international development sector, tends to be uh, oftentimes to follow top-down approaches, again, determined by donor understandings and priorities. And we wanted to somehow help the humanitarian response proactively by helping them contextualize you know, their interventions in the region's historical, religious, cultural, and ethnographic realities, because this is what we have. Our, our comparative advantage was really our, our limited knowledge. Um, so the first thing of uh, document the kind of forms of violence uh, reported in, in the region. Uh, so there has been extensive displacement, as we all know, uh, with, with now thousands of people fleeing to Sudan and other areas of Ethiopia, multiple refugee camps within uh, the region, including in Syria, uh, where, you know, it's, it's one of the areas that hosts one of the largest numbers of IDPs in the country, internally displaced populations. Uh, most of these refugees have been uh, young children and women, um, as you can see in some statistics earlier in the year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, currently, humanitarian organizations have warned that millions have, uh, are facing food insecurity. In fact, it is said the militant elements do not allow farmers to farm uh, as a strategy, and, and there is a, you know, a, a significant risk of people dying from hunger because they cannot farm their farms. 
Uh, there's also lack of medical supplies exacerbated again by looting, uh, by militant elements, but also because of limited access to most parts of Tigray actually. From recent humanitarian um, briefings, it seems that only a few uh, um, districts in, in Waredas within the Tigray region are accessible. So most of the, you know, most of the region where the fighting is ongoing is, has been inaccessible to, inaccessible to the humanitarian agencies. Um, and uh, in terms of violence, uh, violence has been extensive, unfortunately, against civilians. including systematic bombings of residential places, intentional and repeat voice, as well as indirect violence, such as bombs or stray bullets. I have an access, but all the sources are cited in section one of the worksheet and document the atrocities. Um, so the, the literature review we conducted um, essentially responded to these multiple forms of violence that we were he hearing from Tigray, happening in Tigray. Uh, which you know we anticipated would have permanent damaging effects and and would result in complex trauma among both witnesses and victims and survivors of violence, but also even militant elements and soldiers, people fighting in the war from both sides. Um, so we initialized the rapid scoping literature review to identify the international evidence on the relationship between political violence, war, and domestic violence. Uh, in order first to deepen the analysis of domestic violence in now conflict ridden Tigray as part of our ongoing work, because we do anticipate to go back in the future, but also to inform humanitarian responses proactively, as I mentioned. And we also wanted to explore the long term consequences of political violence, uh, such as enforced migration and, and displaced contexts, um, because again, we are, we are aware of um, uh, the, the vulnerabilities that, that uh, displacement causes. So. Uh, you know, we, we would like to draw attention to a continuum of vulnerabilities across the forced migrant journeys and discuss the complex intersection with religious parameters in post displacement in the refugee context, the refugee camp context. Um, the review process, uh, very briefly, I won't go into detail, just I wanted to say um, that this was done by myself and, and one Ethiopian colleague who chose to remain anonymous for personal reasons. Uh, the detailed division of labor can be found in the working paper for, for reasons of transparency. Um, and again, we wanted to, as I said, identify the literature, the types of studies, the, the evidence that exists, and then um, uh, uh, take the key insights and apply them to Tigray, really. Um, so I won't go at all into the literature review, you can read the, the working paper at your time, but I just wanted to mention some key findings and messages which are the most important really and relevant to the current context. Um, so overall the re literature review which looked at um, a conflict uh, at the, at the, at the um, On militants, uh, on militant populations, but also on the general population. It also looked at uh, sexual and gender based violence in refugee camps and displaced contexts and emergency contexts. And the, the, the main fact that continue to face trauma related this comes from various case studies from Rwanda, multiple case studies that we discussed physical damage, uh, disability, and mental health trauma. Uh, uh, that is experienced by victims or even or witnesses. Uh, of violence, of war-related violence. Um, there are other consequences such as fear, shame, and sociocultural and environmental consequences that can lead survivors and ex-combatants to be isolated after the conflict or to be unable to reintegrate in society when peace is restored. Uh, there's also intergenerational components and uh, effects of war-related violence that again can coexist with structural, communal, and domestic forms of violence uh, that pre-existed before the conflicts. So again, this speaks of, again, complex trauma and, and the long-term consequences of violence. And, and the implication here is, again, that 
the response, the humanitarian responses um, must consider not, not just the immediate effects of war violence and how to support the, the victims currently, but also the implied intersections with structural normative and psychological parameters um, and pre-existing forms of violence and seek to support affected groups in ways that can you know, prevent further abuse. Uh, not just in domestic, but also in communal life in post-displacement settings, especially in refugee camps, which tend to uh, show increased levels of IPV and other forms of uh, inter intimate partner violence and other forms of violence uh, following the conflict. Uh, the other key insight relevant to our work is that uh, while domestic violence intersects with conflict-related sexual violence, sexual and gender-based violence, those should be approached uh, as distinct while um, Coexisting, but as distinct phenomena, because they have, they tend to have different etiologies, different explanations. Domestic violence is usually related uh, not just to communal and structural and uh, normative parameters, but also to individual and intersubjective factors, psychological trauma from childhood violence, personality disorders, or attachment insecurity. And again, that may require different types of responses than does conflict-related uh, sexual violence, for instance. Uh, the implication here again is the sector, the term that is usually used is psychosocial services. Um, it has been criticized uh, as being slightly vague uh, as a, because it's an umbrella term that encompasses multiple approaches and um, it's not very useful to understanding the distinctive etiologies of the problem and the distinctive interventions and needs for each problem. Um, but essentially, what, what these, the literature review suggests is that uh, we need a more um, focused approach, uh, you know, a combination of psychological and clinical interventions for those that face complex trauma uh, with a combination of community-wide social environmental measures, which could be you know, financial support, social support, and so on. And these strategies need to be delivered most, most likely in, in parallel, uh, informed by experts, expert diagnosis, uh, but also on the basis of rigorous research. Uh, this will become a very important comment because, again, the humanitarian response has to be very urgent, and usually there's no time or priority for research, but the literature review shows very, 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 um, uh, you know, uh, strongly that responses have to understand first communities' own conditions and understandings and then respond. Um, and uh, to very, you know, very, very relevant to this point, any intervention or response needs to be contextualized in, in the community's own religious, cultural, normative systems uh, to consider, you know, how family and social structures and institutions broken during the conflict may be restored uh, to prevent other forms of violence, uh, but also to contribute to effective perpetrator treatment and reintegration in society in, in post-conflict time. So uh, in, in parallel, what we were trying to do through this working paper was not just to understand the international evidence, but also to point the humanitarian agencies, this working paper has been shared with the humanitarian agencies currently, um, to, the con to, to the particular context of Tigray and, and to help them understand uh, you know, what, um, how to adapt their interventions right, to regional history, to Tigrayan society and the people's religious cultural beliefs and values as well as understand pre-existing structural domestic or, or other forms of violence experienced by the population, especially women and girls. Um, we also wanted to draw attention to the fact that, you know, there have been extensive efforts by Tigrayan women to improve the status of women and to address domestic violence and inequalities since the liberation struggle against the Turks. So, you know, we're, we're, we're very conscious about not losing the agency of the people in the current humanitarian response and acknowledging, uh, acknowledging their activism throughout the years, uh, while still, you know, admitting and recognizing the problems of domestic violence that do exist in the region as, as in the rest of the country. Um, and also to point to the fact that Tigray is a deeply religious society with an, the indigenous Ethiopian Orthodox child of Christianity being uh, most prevalent and having been formally embraced in the kingdom of Aksum in the fourth century. Uh, and, and to ensure that this, uh, you know, that, it, that, 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 that uh, the people's uh, heritage, religious heritage is, is considered and, and that the influence that religious tradition has on the people currently uh, again, is, is taking into consideration in current inter interventions. 
Um, another photo, just to break the monotony. Uh, this is from uh, um, a liturgy in Mariamstion, if I remember clearly. Um, okay, so the other the other uh, interest in the working paper was obviously to isolate uh, linkages between war-related violence and uh, with religious parameters. Uh, war-related violence, domestic violence, and religious parameters. Um, and uh, what became evident is that again, religious parameters have been mostly neglected in the in this in the scholarship uh, on domestic violence uh, in emergency contexts. Uh, the resourcefulness of religious personnel and religious beliefs has not generally been considered. Uh, and in contrast to the international development sector, which has engaged in recent decades quite thoroughly with religious stakeholders, the humanitarian sector seems to be quite a bit behind on that as well. Um, the literature suggests overall that religious beliefs and spiritual activity can serve as coping mechanisms. Uh, from the, I, I have cited a few studies there, as you can read. But of course, in many contexts, religious parameters interface with, again, culture-specific folklore beliefs uh, that might not necessarily be theological. And, and, and again, those might have more pernicious implications. Uh, on the other hand, as, as in a study from Northern Uganda, bullet point three, um, the, there might be other beliefs in society around, for instance, the activity of spirits. Uh, which can then shape people's attitudes toward um, ex-combatants, combatant, for instance. Uh, so in, in Northern Uganda, um, women who had participated in the violence and had symptoms uh, after the violence, uh, post-traumatic st stress uh, or any other symptoms, um, those could be interpreted as possession by evil spirits, which then resulted in women's further abuse, mistreatment or isolation by society in post-conflict. So again, we can see that, that religious cultural parameters are very important uh, and need to be understood and need to be integrated in, in any analysis of the consequences of violence, uh, given, given any specific context. Uh, but overall, the, the literature on domestic violence from uh, low, low and middle income countries uh, agrees that faith serves mostly as a coping mechanism. In, a, in such context, female victims may resort to religious beliefs to condemn the abuse, and through their ordeals, they may actually acquire a more justice-oriented understanding of their faith, which again helps them to address the harmful situation they find themselves in. Um, so before I discuss how this evidence overall applies to the current, uh, to, to, to the context of Tigray, I just wanted to mention a little bit on the current humanitarian response and challenges, as these have been communicated to me. I, I'm not, a, I, again, I, I, I'm not a representative, you know, I'm not, I don't have the most up-to-date information. Uh, but I have tried to cite uh, information that, 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 that has been reported uh, in written to me. Uh, first and foremost, uh, current responses to sexual and gender-based violence and efforts to promote children's protection uh, are being led by international humanitarian agencies, the UN agencies, in coordination with regional government ministries, such as the bureaus of uh, labor and social affairs in the region as well as NGOs and INGOs that work in the region and have access and capacity to contribute to the humanitarian response. The response has focused on providing, uh, it, it, the SGBV response, uh, on providing immediate support to victims who arrive on refugee camps and other displaced contexts, such as through the provision of dignity kits, uh, psychosocial support and case management for GBV uh, survivors and women and girls at risk. Um, humanitarian uh, actors, however, seem to be quite um, limited in, in, what, in their capacity and access to the region because of the high security as fighting is ongoing in, in most places. Uh, and that means that those who probably need most of the help are not reached. Um, psychological, on the other hand, psychological specialization and capacity to train social workers that already act in the region to support and to counsel victims and to manage cases of rape of rape victims, for instance, uh, is not enough and, and is hard to mobilize. Although currently there is efforts are being made to mobilize new partners and new specialists from Addis Ababa to Tigray in order to help in, uh, to help in this process. Um, the UNHCR, which with, with 
which I communicated in the early days, actually, um, I wanted you to address this should be integrated. Uh, and although this offers helpful starting points, uh, there, there's, there's a space for it to be adapted to the regional context and to integrate some of the insights of our working paper and our literature review. Um, so, for instance, one of the objectives identified in the strategy is to strengthen SGBV referral pathways in the region, uh, and it is agreed, you know, in our conversations, we agree that this can be achieved more um, better by integrating the refugee policy with national efforts and initiatives, such as referral systems that are currently being set up across the country by the Ethiopian Women Lawyers Association, which is a collaborator to our project. Another objective of the strategy is to build the capacity of traditional justice and safety systems inside the camps uh, on formal legislative procedures, care records, and case management. Integrai region, most village units, what are known as tabias, have their own social courts that adjudicate on family issues. Um, so there might be opportunities to set up mobile courts uh, using the workers who might be present in the refugee camps or training other community members. But of course, in order to, to ensure that this does, uh, it is successful, um, one needs to consider the sociocultural and gender related um, biases that, that sometimes govern the practices of the social courts uh, officers who tend to be male. So, you know, any such approach needs to ensure that they are properly trained and sensitized. Uh, and again, the strategy identifies the objective to partner with development, uh, with, ex, um, excuse me, religious actors and religious stakeholders on children's issues, but it doesn't, it's silent on GBV uh, and the clergy. Uh, so there's definitely more space, more room to integrate the clergy in IPV as GBV response strategies currently. Uh, and this is something that we as are really advocating for currently in, in our communication with the humanitarian agencies. There is a lot, again, based on the evidence we've conducted, but also the, the central role that the clergy have in Tigrayan society, uh, we think that there is opportunity here uh, for them to become resourceful. So uh, in the previous research, uh, you know, it emerged that, uh, again, faith was, was quite positive, a positive force in women's life. Uh, it was used as a coping mechanism, but also as a, as a, uh, as a resource to rationalize, you know, uh, uh, unreasonable situation uh, or other trauma, mar marriage related trauma. Uh, and it was never used to justify partner abuse uh, on behalf of the women. The clergy, on the other hand, were very much involved in the mediation of conjugal pro problems. And again, despite the fact that sometimes they didn't really understand the side complex psychology of the perpetrator and the victim uh, domestic violence in the community support the victims they offered shelter financial support they tried to prioritize the safety of the victim and and you know they they were an important resource when other institutions failed the police or the social courts or even women's associations when those failed the clergy uh, were still available right to provide some support um, so, so I think, you know, the, while, while it's not advised for the clergy to, to try and reform a perpetrator or, or you know, uh, solve, uh, you know, e e situations of domestic violence, uh, they might become resor resourceful in this time um, uh, by, uh, by raising their awareness of sexual violence in, in the war and the trauma related to sexual violence and how they can respond to victims and survivors in a sensitive manner, in a manner that validates their experiences so that re-traumatization is avoided. In addition, since there is lack of psychosocial support currently, there's limited human resources on the ground. The clarity being already available and already um, with life events and traumas, uh, if, if appropriately trained, could become a resource, um, uh, you know, and filling the gap again of the lacking human resources currently uh, in, in the region. And, and, and just thinking of the lack of access, right? Uh, humanitarian agencies cannot, cannot reach most of the, of the uh, area in Tigray. So uh, clergies are, are already available. And since they already provide the support, uh, they might become, uh, you know, again, uh, an important resource in this time. 
Um, I, I also wanted before I, I conclude and, and pass on the word to the to the uh, to our participants here, to our attendees, uh, to ask questions and share thoughts. I just wanted to re um, refer very quickly to the role of faith or religious discourse in public and political um, narratives currently in Ethiopia. We have noticed that religious language has been misused, even with some church-affiliated people who have either, you know, uh, such as, you know, in the form of clergy blessing combatants before the war or promoting the war as patriotic. Um, and uh, as a result, currently, uh, this is not just disconcerting from a theological perspective, but also many Tigrayans feel disappointed and alienated by the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawada Church. Um, and, you know, there are even fears of, of a sort of separatist movement within the church. in the same way that the Eritrean Orthodox Church had for decades. Um, what we have to change uh, against offensive war, the church is very, the Orthodox faith is very clear, clearly uh, opposed against war, um, even uh, in defensive war, um, those who do kill in time of uh, attacks uh, oftentimes are um, ostracized from the, from, the, from the church. There's, there's multiple canons about murderers in time of war. And, and in general, the, the, the faith takes a very clear position against any form of violence uh, and sees the clergy as peacemakers and really as uh, protectors of, you know, as advocates for peace at all, at, at, at all times. So we, we are very um, aware of the misuse of religious language, very cautious, and we try to, uh, you know, publicly advocate about uh, or clarify, you know, theological positions on war, uh, violence, and murder in time of war, um, in order to ensure that religious language is not used to justify political aims currently. So this is another way that we have found ourselves able to be again resourceful or helpful in some in some way in the situation. Uh, and we also think, you know, being in Ethiopia, where um, again multiple Ethiopians have. In, in different conversations have justified the war on the basis of you know, the previous political activity of the TPLF cadres. Uh, we, we find it very essential in this time to speak against vengeance and revenge in favor of peace and reconciliation. Um, and and we, we, are very, uh, we, we're very strong about um, you know, advocating that the diaspora in particular, the Ethiopian and Eritrean diaspora have to become more aware and reflexive about the, the, the force of their own discourse through social media and to be aware that, that they are contributing to the continuation of animosities and grudges sometimes uh, through the things they say and write. Um, so being, being based in Addis Ababa and hearing the, these different discourses, uh, we, are, you know, we, we find it um, very urgent to, to you know, uh, strengthen discourses around peace and reconciliation, to really find ways to talk about unity and. Uh, and overcoming past hostilities, grudges, and animosities. And again, as a faith-based initiative, we, we, we find and, and we feel that this is something we can contribute again uh, in the current time. And uh, I will not say more. I just wanted to mention two other articles that we have published, uh, again, to uh, contribute to um, the current crisis in the ways we can. One on to raise awareness around sexual, uh, about sexual violence in Tigray, and another one coordinated through the Orthodox outlet for dogmatic inquiries, uh, which is a, a collaborator, I guess, uh, to our project. Um, to stress again what the what the theological perspective on war is, and to ask for uh, you know to to encourage people to think in terms of love, forgiveness, and peace in this time. And I'll end here. I'll stop sharing. Um, and I, I hope this has helped to give you some idea of what we're doing, what we're dealing with, and what the discourses currently are on the ground. Uh, but please feel free to ask questions and clarifications. I don't know if this is, Lars, what you expected me to present on, but... I I'm uh, overwhelmed <laughs> because um, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, get, get you to explain a little bit what you're doing in Ethiopia, but actually this was a proper lecture, so I'm very... Uh, I'm very pleased. Yes. Uh, that, um, anyways, so... Um, Yes, I, I'm. Um, I, I'm still um, in awe of technology, so I think it's very nice uh, that we can actually share um, 
a space uh, which is um, uh, combining all of our existences at the moment. And um, uh, you have clearly not forgotten your English. That's very good. Yes, that's uh, the technology also was also cooperating. And uh, I, um, uh, well, I have several questions related to the 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 the. Um, presentation that you gave, but I think f first we should let everybody uh, co contribute with their own observations and so on before I, I get back to any of mine, because otherwise we'll, we'll talk, um, you know, you and I until uh, the end of the day. <laughs> yes. Okay. Any Anybody who, who has questions, please uh, unmute yourselves and uh, just ask, because we're not that many today. It's a lovely circle of friends. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Lars, I just wanted to say you are recording this. I recording. hope That's people right. are aware because some, yes. some people joined us a bit later. Yes. Yes, I, I have to repeat, that's true, a few uh, joined later, that this is being recorded. If you would prefer to um, ask a question that you will not, you would not, rather not have recorded, uh, you can just, um, uh, yes. Oh, I can change this. Yes, then uh, I saw your message, Jörg. Um, but the um, so in that case, put the, put your question into the um, in, into the chat space, and then at the end, I'm going to stop the recording, and then at the end we can discuss this. Um, absolutely, yes. Uh, sorry, I have to go and uh, unmute you first of all. Uh, I'm going to un. No, this is the wrong one. <laughs> if we can meet everyone, that would be lovely. Yes, you have. Um, I think this is because they um, um, slightly. No, I don't. I don't want to switch ourselves off. That's the problem. <laughs> yes, uh, this is up here. <laughs> yes, one second. Mm. It's technology. It's never easy. <laughs> oh, um, joke. Yes. Joke. Oh, okay. Yeah, that worked. That worked. Okay. Yeah. I, I do it one by one. The collective one didn't work for whatever reason. <laughs> All right. That In the work. participants window, you should be able to set the rules. Yes, that's um, that's that's usually what's that. But um. Oh. Yes. Uh, I mean, while yes, while, yes, yes. while you do that, uh, maybe I can I can ask a question. Uh, first of all, Remina, uh, thank you so much, and uh, that Andrew. Uh, Sorry. At least it's not only me. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm back to to unmute it. What, uh, are you another Sava now, Romina? Are you up in the north? No, currently I'm in Addis Ababa. I'm in Addis Ababa. Yeah. Before you join us, I just mentioned that I haven't traveled yeah. to Tigray. Yeah, I communicate on the phone, and yeah. our have managed to travel to Addis Ababa when right. happening in Mekale and when the road from Aksum to Mekale was open. Currently, I believe it's again closed. Yeah, yeah, because of the fighting south of Mekale, yeah. yeah. Um, I have two questions and they're both quite large. Um, I mean, one is I, I've been kind of observing the Protestant discourse around the war and it's quite febrile and diverse. Mm -hmm. um, the Protestant fellowship has come out against the war in the beginning, but of course there's lots of Protestant priests who support uh, Abiy Ahmed and others who are against him. Tamrat Laina recently came out against him, former PM, who was a Pente. Um, and I mean, you say that the Orthodox Church has this sort of um, stance against war and warfare in general, but of course in the past they've often been just as any other religion involved in the politics, and as I believe they are now as well. So if you could give us a little bit more about the diversity that I would suspect is there also on the Orthodox position. And the second question is, is a bit more about the project. Um, I mean, I think, I think this, this is really great, but in, in, in a sense, you're in this sort of emergency situation now where a lot of the other things don't really apply, right? When you were dealing with domestic violence before you had the priest, as part of the community where both perpetrator and victim were there and the priest could speak to the men about it because of course they're men so they could pick up that angle of things and and now when we're looking at sexual violence and i mean the the, the scale and 
of, of violence that you can see that's been perpetrated um, or the, the various interviews you can see in Al Jazeera and other places of, of, of the places where women receive help in McAllay and, and, and clinics. I never see a priest in these videos. You know, um, it could be that they're not there. It could be that they're not depicted. Uh, I would suspect they're not there because they're men and speaking to women about these very sensitive personal issues and the traumas that they suffered uh, would probably not be the right place. So where is the role of priests when the perpetrator, the men who have perpetrated this violence are often not present in the community? So wh wh where do you see the challenge here? Again, two large questions, I hope you don't mind. Shall I answer or take more? I can answer while people prepare their questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I have, thank you, York, for excellent questions as always, challenging and excellent. Uh, I haven't followed so much the Protestant discourse, to be honest, but I do know, well, I follow the discourse of the Amhara uh, sort of, you know, region and ethnicity and, and how they respond to Abiy Ahmed. And as you know, recently there were protests in North Shore, which is another irony because we shifted the project from Tigray to North Shore. And now we cannot work in North Shore because protests are ongoing. We're hoping that after Fasik, after Easter, it, you know, it will come down and we'll be able to work in the region. Um, but you, you are right, it's, it's, it, it's been, uh, not, I don't want to say inconsistent, right? It, it's been sort of mutating, I guess, you know, discourses are, are not um, monolithic, uh, there's different positions and the society is divided, I think, from my understanding and my discussions, not everyone takes the same position. There are people of diverse ethnicities who are against the war and people who are in, not in favor, but they think that the war is the only solution. That I think that's the right way of putting it uh, because of the perception that people have of the activity of the TPLF in the past. Uh, and it's the same with the Orthodox community, I think, largely, um, because you know the Orthodox community crosses across ethnicities. It's not, um, it's not just the Tigrayans or the Amharas, it, it crosses across the, across the ethnicities in, in Ethiopia. And what is important to note and to recognize is that ethnicity has become more important than religion in, in some way, right? Ethnicity has, has become really a dividing factor in the church and, and as, an, as an outsider, as some, but also as someone who works with the church, right? And church organizations, um, I can see that the war is something that is not discussed openly, is not talked about because ethnicity is such a sensitive aspect. And if someone discusses the word, then that will lead to the topic of ethnicity. And because ethnicity is such a sensitive topic, nobody is going to, to discuss it. Um, so, so yes, there is a diversity of opinion, right? A diversity of positions. Um, I think what I have noticed to be very open now, I don't know if I should be very honest, um, is that those who are critical of the war are afraid to be critical, openly critical, uh, because they don't think that we are in a democracy and there is consequences if you speak out, to put it this way. Um, so there, are, there might be pe people uh, from multiple ethnicities, again, not to name, not to single out an ethnicity, who are uh, opposed to the war, but they will not speak out because of the, of, of the imminent, imminent consequences. Um, in terms of the of the church, uh, yes, I, I wouldn't want to generalize. I think initially in the early days, most religious uh, stakeholders had taken, uh, you know, uh, issued statements of, for peace, and you know, in the early days, and then things kind of shifted. Uh, the the next snapshot I have in my mind is when clergies were uh, blessing combatants before the war started in November, in early November in the stadium, you know, in Ethiopia where people um, gathered to give blood, you know, for the soldiers and so on. And, and that really surprised me to see because I knew that the church had issued a statement earlier about peace and so on. I will not go into details, but there are divisions within the church and people who, again, it, it's, it's ethnicity based. There are antagonisms within the church uh, and alliances within the church on the basis of, of ethnicity and the position that people take about the war. Uh, so I would say that nobody has been unaffected by the current division in society, right? Everyone is divided, including the church itself. And I think this is where the challenge lies, that you cannot have a 
a uniform position in the current era and, uh, and, and uh, condition. It's, it's really hard to bring people on the same page. That's what I'm trying to say. Everyone seems to be, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of multiple uh, discourses that um, uh, conflict with each other. And, and it's, what I see in society currently is that people don't know who to believe. What I, what I meant by the faith is against offensive war uh, was the theological teaching. So it's, it's, the theological teaching is very different from the discourse of the church and is very different from the discourses of the individual clergies, right? So that I think that answers a little bit the first, first question. In terms of the second uh, question, that, that was an excellent question and point, uh, indeed. Um, and I hear multiple, some disappointing accounts about clergies, in even in Tigray. So I hear very hopeful accounts and very disappointing accounts. The hopeful accounts are that clergies are there to provide spiritual support, you know, that the people feel that the clergies in Tigray really understand the meaning of the faith to the clergy in, in Addis Ababa who have, you know, uh, are in favor of the war, at least this is the perception that some people in Tigray have. On the other hand, what I hear is that there are some clergy who even ask high amounts of money to provide a service in Tigray currently, you know, because of the limited resources. So they're, you know, it's a big, they're, they're uh, uh, showing opportunistic behavior, which is very sad. But I guess what I mean here is that given the lack of resources and, and uh, you know, availability of professionals or any kind of support in most of the community, the clergies are, are a point of, um, you know, a support system for the people. It's some, some, you know, you have your spiritual father, you go to your spiritual father uh, about life events and traumas and disappointments. And when, hope, when there is no hope, the faith and the clergy are, 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 are a source of hope in some way for many people. And again, I hear this from my colleagues in Tigray as I speak with them. Uh, there's a, there's an ex extensive disappointment, just I wanted to add this. People are emotionally, you know, um, entirely disappointed and feel hopeless. And speaking about the faith uh, or being able to, to go to the, your spiritual father and, and share your disappointments and hopelessness, you know, it's, it's, it can be a source of coping, a way of coping, essentially. You are right that even in domestic violence in peacetime in Tigray, women, when they do speak to their spiritual father, they'll tend to not reveal the real nature of their problem. They will say, my husband is high lenya, he's difficult or whatever, but they will not say he's beating me because they're ashamed, because they want, don't want to share, you know, or expose the husband. It's true. Um, when the situation becomes, however, very serious, they do say, they, they do tend to reveal the, the, the true nature of the situation. And even mo in most cases, they don't have to reveal it because someone in the community will know and will communicate it to the clergy and the clergy will be called in to mediate. In this case, sexual violence is such an extent, is such a serious trauma and serious uh, you know, uh, form of abuse that I, and so extensive uh, that the way it seems to me, people are, are currently more likely to speak about it. You know, you are right to grow a conservative society. People are unlikely to speak about sexual matters. You know, it's a bit taboo, I guess. Um, virginity is, is, you know, highly appreciated in, in uh, Tigrayan society, especially for young girls. So, you know, it's not something that you would want to reveal uh, if you have been raped. Uh, however, it sounds like women currently are sort of overcoming these norms. You know, women are going to hospitals to get to uh, obtain um, contraception, for example, proactively against rape. You can see a shift already in society, right? Responding to the extremity of the violence, the extensiveness of the violence. Um, so I think, I think this is, you know, it's such a terrible situation, but it, cr it creates this opportunity of, of becoming more out outspoken about the problem. And, and, and I think if we engage the clergies to become aware, first and foremost, of the extensiveness of sexual violence, to raise awareness in their community, to not be, a sh to not be shy to speak about these issues, because this is a, a, you know, a form of abuse that uh, shouldn't, um, uh, what is it, um, shouldn't make someone feel ashamed because they have uh, been raped or, or a victim of sexual violence. It's something that one should be able to speak about in society and in community. Um, I think it can become an opportunity to, you know, to uh, raise awareness first and foremost, but also to make the clergy part of this campaign and 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 and, uh, and um, effort. Again, because 
they they are a source of hope and faith right they are the representatives of god in society for many people in the countryside um they they represent for the people hope and you know spiritual support and i think if we if we don't engage with the clergy then we miss this opportunity that's what i mean i don't say that it's ideal it really isn't and there's multiple obstacles as you say communication between a male clergy and a female uh, victim survivor, but I also think it can become resourceful and if we don't engage them, it can actually become pernicious because if the clergy don't understand the trauma and we may continue hiding it and they continue you know, in, in post-conflict, hopefully at some point, uh, when they speak to their sp spiritual children and they don't understand the implications of that trauma, you know, they will continue providing spiritual support in misguided ways. That's what I'm trying to say. But if they're informed and trained at this time, uh, not to resolve the problem, but to really know how to respond to it with sensitivity, then they can become resourceful. That, that's what I meant. I don't mean that they should be psychologists or you know, psychosocial uh, specialists, but really to be informed and to be engaged um, with the humanitarian agencies and all the briefings I've received uh, you know, again, all the agencies are doing the best they can. I have, I have seen no formal mention of engaging religious stakeholders. And I put this question just in the final, in the recent donor briefing, uh, which was last week, um, uh, which involved Tigrayan partners and the UN agencies. I put this question of how the religious stakeholders are engaged and they say currently they are starting to engage them in awareness raising and community engagement. So. I think they are realizing that they can become resourceful. Um, I hope this answered the question. But again, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not suggesting that they are, you know, they should be the ones resolving the problem. I just think that as an important component of society, uh, including the social course, the police, women's association, they also should be integrated in any response uh, and intervention appropriately, of course. Uh, I hope this is helpful, Jörg. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, this I'm going to sneak in one question which um, I, I had earlier on. Uh, when you spoke about the clergy, um, it's understood that they're all men. Huh? But um, is there a an informal um, clerical? Mm -hmm. Is there something in the clerical hierarchy, which where the um, or in the sub clerical hierarchy where women play a, a role as diaconesses, for example, or as uh, as as helpers as assistants uh, where women can go to in the first place? I mean, women have always been active in the church, in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, um, whether it is through, uh, you know, providing food for the homeless and cooking and, you know, uh, supporting, uh, different ceremonies and liturgies, you know, there are, there, there's a uh, the choir, there are uh, the dancers, and so on. They have been they have been integral in in church life, but there there isn't uh, the specific rank of a diaconesis. Although this is this is something that is being discussed currently in the modern theological colleges. It's something that I think the church is very interested in, perhaps reviving or or exploring how this could be revived. Revived, um, but there are but there are the wives of the clergies because clergies marry within the Ethiopian Orthodox. Uh, tradition so uh, it might speak to the wife of the priest uh, although in my experience I didn't really encounter this pattern or trend where women would feel comfortable to speak to the, to the wife of the priest again I think because of the hierarchy or you know not feeling feeling that they, they don't they're quite different in their life situations you know the clergy and the laity uh, perceive them perceive themselves as quite different I, I want to say that, you know, the clergy tend to be perceived as the representatives of God on earth. And what they do in their married life is not always perceived as something that applies to the ladies' married life, if that makes sense. Um, there are, however, other women. There's women's associations in, a, in any, every tabia, every village community in Tigray, um, based on the research that I have conducted. And these aim to communicate women's issues to the zonal. Uh, you know, to, to the Wereda to the Wereda office, and then to the zonal office to ensure these issues from the countryside reach 
you know, policymakers essentially. So there is that communication line, but there's also what we call uh, the ADIR, um, so sort of funeral association and other support associations where people contribute small monies and then they can learn, um, borrow the money and use it for, you know, various uh, needs in their lives. And these tend to be very supportive systems, but again, it, it all depends on the trust of the members. Many of them disintegrate because trust disintegrates because people don't pay in time or, or contribute in time. Um, so there are multiple groups uh, associations where again women are very key, but 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 it's I think in, in the church is quite limited. I think it's hard to find another woman in the church with you know in a theological capacity where you feel that uh, you know she she will be able to advise you from a theological perspective. Again, this is a very conservative society, tra very tradition oriented in the speaking of the countryside, not this not. In Addis Ababa, we have many female theologians. We have a hair that we are doing as well. Uh, but in the countryside, people again have, I think, this perception that women should be humble and not, uh, not take the position of. Yes, I think Lars, you know, model, role model in the church or you know um so i think it would be very important and resourceful uh, yes. because I, as, as york said it's much easier to open up to another female yeah. uh, about these issues especially sexual related yes. issues yeah. uh, and a male kid, who might not even understand if you think you'll not understand you'll not even share it right that that that's how that's uh, a victimized woman might uh, think yes uh, yeah absolutely so thank you very much um Questions from others. Yeah, you should be able to unmute yourselves, all of you now. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. can, can I speak? Can, yes. I, I'm being, um, look, I, I came to the meeting a bit late, and so if I uh, cross anything that I missed, I apologise in advance. But what I haven't heard is a dimension to do with sexual violence as a form of communication, as a form of dysfunctional communication, if you like. But um, I, I remember. Um, reading about um, uh, monkeys who had learned to sign and how monkeys defecate and uh, hurl, um, well, on, on, on their, their victims. Uh, and in learning to sign, uh, they use language instead. Um, so working it backwards, um, mm -hmm. you can see that some sorts of violence, perhaps are uh, through inadequate education to express emotion, but also that violence can be a form of communication beyond words uh, to do with the idea of what's the transference and scapegoating. Uh, now, at the, at the heart at the heart of religion, there is. Uh, the crucified of, of Christianity, there's the crucified Jesus. And you have the carrying and the uh, transfiguration of that suffering into something which becomes redemption. Uh, at the heart of mm -hmm. Christianity, you have a religious cult which was spread and displaced a uh, the Mithras cult within the Roman army and Jesus mm -hmm. and Christianity became very much um, pervade by the Roman army and you could perhaps look at uh, religion as a um, coping mechanism for post-traumatic stress disorder and yeah. in seeing in seeing religion in this sort of way then the paradox and the difficulty for the involvement of clergy in this process is their recognition that the religious outlook is compri comprises within itself also a making sense of shared pain and suffering. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> I, 
when you speak frankly, if I may, it sounds yeah, like you're right. a psychologist. <laughs> you speak a, like a psychologist. No, may no I I'm not. I, I worked in cultural relations. I worked with the British Council. Um, but I have two schizophrenic sons, uh, two schizophrenic oh. brothers, brothers, and I've had a lot of engagement in, in, in my own Christian tradition. Uh, I, I was with the religious order for a couple of years. So I'm very interested in, in these dimensions, the anthropological yeah. dimension of Christianity. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the thoughts. I, I, I wouldn't know what, you know, I don't have a confident answer to that, but I did want to say that I, I, this this comment on sexual violence as a form of lack of communication, I am I am myself very interested in what allows the militant elements, and I want names. Sides to commit this kind of uh, forced into camps, raped repeatedly, gang raped, uh, oftentimes physically abused. Uh, their organs destroyed. So, you know, this agrees, this agrees with those perspectives that speak of ethnic cleansing or genocide. Uh, I don't want to take a position. This, I'm not a political analyst. That's not my what to look into. And what more, but I wouldn't, perhaps it's not as complicated as you might suggest, because what happens in wartime is that militant elements are given, uh, you know, consume um, alcohol and um, engage in drug abuse. Mm. So most of these, you know, soldiers who fight obviously are inebriated and have other substances within their bodies. And obviously that, you know, shapes their behavior, informs their behavior uh, and breaks down whatever um, conscience based restrictions people might have to commit this kind of violence, which goes back to, you know, the psychological mechanisms I think you're pointing to. The other thing I wanted to mention is that I'm not exactly sure about the demographic of the soldiers, the Ethiopian and reported Eritrean soldiers fighting on the ground. Uh, however, the report suggests that most of them are Arabic speakers, not from the highlands, but from the lowlands of Eritrea which means that they are not Christian Orthodox. Uh, they might be of other faiths. I don't want to name a certain faith because uh, again, I have no clarity on this, no certitude. But initially I was thinking to myself, how can soldiers of the same faith, same faith uh, with basic Christian understanding, right? Could, can commit this kind of atrocities. If there is a, uh, differences in the faith, and I'm not saying that all the soldiers are of, the, of a different faith, they might, some of them might be Christian, and, and a lot of uh, Ethiopian and Amhara militias who commit atrocities are over, come from the Ethiopian Orthodox tradition, right? So I think this is very clear. Uh, but I think the religious aspect might also have a contributing, contributing effect, which, which is something we need to look at, and it's something we will only be able to research on after we know the demographic of the soldiers and we conduct ethnographic research to know how their specific affiliation informs their response, right? And their behavior in, in the field, in the, in the war zone, uh, you know, in wartime. So that's on the side. In terms of sexual violence, just I wanted to add, you know, in Tigray, it, it is true there has been sexual violence before and there have been rapes before. You know, it's a society like any society. Uh, there are problems of sexual violence, stranger, stranger, stranger violence and to some extent sexual coercion in marriage. And sexual coercion in marriage is generally not admitted because within the, the Christian framework of the people, uh, a man and a woman share the same body, become one body essentially. And you know a wife could not refuse her husband, that's the idea. And even the clergy would think in those terms. And I encounter some clergy thinking in those terms. But I want to uh, warn against this idea. There is, there is a discourse currently going on on Twitter, which, tries to essentially blame the victims or blame Tigray society for the sexual violence. And I think we need to be very careful about this. Tigray society is a very peace oriented society. This is what the clergy will teach. This is how the people will behave. The people will say, and this is what the people told me specifically, uh, if, if they don't agree with each other, wife and man, they should separate. There's no need for violence when you can just is 
very is ubiquitous in Tigray. So it's a society that really was previously, and the fact that they don't like conflict is because they have been fought wars before and they understand the trauma of war. People don't like conflict in Tigray. This is very true. And although there has been, again, some violence, sexual violence, stranger violence, it's not something that has been approved uh, or tolerated by the community, it's something that is condemned, both on religious and cultural uh, grounds. So I just want us to be very careful, you know, it's, uh, we, we shouldn't suggest that there is something inherent in the culture of the people, or, you know, the nature of the society that allows this kind of violence to, to, to be committed. The violence is committed because the political leadership has allowed it to be committed and because the soldiers are committing it. Let's be clear about it, okay? We should well, not- I think, I think the, that's more ideology speaking because what you're not looking at is the need for every individual combatant to make yeah. sense of their place in the world and what they're mm. doing. Well, yeah, it's true, of course. It depends on their individual choices. I agree absolutely with you. But, you know, there have been contexts in, in African wars, right? Whether Rwanda, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Papua New Guinea, where there depending on whether it's happened. In previous wars in Tigray, there was no such extensive sexual violence. And I think we need to, so if you look from a historical perspective, this kind of form of sexual violence is out of the norm for Tigray and Ethiopia as a whole, to my understanding. So I think we need to put it in a historical perspective. As well. Uh, York is nodding his head. I'm happy to hear if he has any <laughs> further thoughts on this. But I think John Bins wanted to speak for a long time. John, would you like to? <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, it's unmusing. Well, I mean, two questions, really, Romina, um, or comments. One's quite general, which is, um, I mean, listening to the news with Ethiopia, I mean, it's sort of full of the uh, forthcoming uh, June, I, I, um, I, I, sorry, it, it, it elections. And yes. I just wondered what, what uh, whether there was what the feelings are, and quite how your impressions about how that's proceeding. The other one is I'm interested in um, looking at uh, women and the development agency I work with. Um, the women's self help groups are incredibly powerful in building up empowering women. Um, they, and I've seen in Hawassa, for example, very strong women's groups who are challenging gender violence. Um, I mean, there's one case I came across recently of a, just a group of about 12, 12 women who found a girl who'd been raped and they took her to the police station. And they insisted that the perpetrator was um, accused and was uh, punished for his crime. And I, you know, the, the women's groups are such a powerful force within um, development strategies. I'm interested uh, to know whether there's a kind of um, an opportunity for learning and exchange of knowledge and ideas between the developed community and the religious community within Tigray. Thank you, John. Yes, absolutely. Um, in terms of the elections, again, I'm not a, a political analyst, but I do see. Um, Again, a divided society, people who just don't want to engage at all and uh, are entirely disappointed with the political situation. Uh, very low, very low engagement so far, at least from the numbers we see of, of uh, you know, participants in the current elect registered numbers for the current elections. But from the, the, the people I speak to, many, many just want to abstain. Uh, but that's kind of the, you know, some, some, um, you know, some of the impressions that I hear, I can't cumulatively what the attitude of the society is. I see a lot of uh, disappointment, disillusionment and, and uh, people wanting to abstain and not taking a position. Um, in terms of self-help self -help groups and women's activism, you're absolutely right. Uh, and that, that's why I made, the, I made the comment early that when we try to contextualize or shape current interventions in Tigray, we need to think of the historical activism activism of women in the region, what they have worked towards in the past decades. When I arrived in Aksum in 2016, uh, people tended to report to me that there had been extensive domestic violence awareness uh, trainings uh, a few years ago uh, organized by the local government. 
So there was a, already a lot of awareness uh, about domestic violence. People had been, you know, made aware of, of the consequences of domestic violence. They were more likely to speak about it. Perhaps if I had conducted my research, you know, five or 10 years earlier, it wouldn't be the same response, right? So, so this shows, goes to show that a lot of activism and a lot of work has been going on in the region. Uh, I believe bef just before the war, there was a, an active demonstration in Mekale as well by women against rape, against the violation of women's rights in the region. So, you know, we, we shouldn't take away, that's why I said we shouldn't take away the agency of, of the women of Tigray or we'll try to speak on their behalf. And, and I'm just very conscious of that. You know, I don't want to represent their realities. Uh, from my research in the region, I see a very active, what, what was before that, a very active government in terms of gender issues, uh, women being more aware of their rights, uh, going to the social courts more, more frequently, more regularly, demanding, you know, that police officers follow up with their cases, and the women's bureaus, uh, you know, in the Wereda, in the administrative units, uh, the administrative um, sort of, um, uh, uh, the regional office, I guess, uh, had, uh, you know, were, were becoming more active. We're doing surveys to understand women's problems, to understand how to support them better, to understand what kind of abuses they were facing in their communities. So there was a lot of mobilization. Uh, that's what I would like to say. Um, but at the same time, I cannot tell you how effective these have been, right? I don't know in, in terms of um, the causal effects, whether, whether, whether these have cause societal change and attitudes, but they have existed and they have been very strong uh, to, my, to my knowledge and experience. Uh, and I think this, this answers your question. Yes, thank you. And then we have a question by uh, Jordan, Jordan Anderson. Yes, hi. Uh, first thing, okay. can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can hear you, Jordan. Apologies, I'm, I'm trying to make my camera come on. Um, It's not working. Uh, I'll just ask verbally if I can. Uh, firstly, okay. thank you very much for your remarks. It's, it's, it's been interesting. I, I want to ask a slightly specific question if I could. Um, so with the, with the displacement of, uh, of ethnic Tigrayans, especially in Western Tigray, um, being carried out by the Amhara militias there, I, I wanted to ask, what, do you know anything about how that's impacting the, the Tigrayan clergy and the church properties um, in that area? Do you know if uh, the Tigrayan clergy are also being forced out along with their communities or are the church properties being taken over by, by new clergy who are coming in or, or are they being uh, left out of it? Uh, Thank you, Jordan. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I have no concrete uh, documentation on that. I have heard what I have been told in the accounts I have heard directly from Tigray colleagues um, is that attacks of churches and monasteries are extensive, have happened. Uh, land grabbing is happening, and I'm sure that churches and monasteries are not immune to it. That, that would be my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> any more questions? We have... Um, Joe, is Joe? 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 Joe wanted to speak. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I, I always have a um, hundred questions, <laughs> um, but um, before I ask a question, let me just say thank you so much for uh, the benefit of your thinking this last hour and a half. Uh, it is such an honor to, to listen to you speak. And um, I mean, my, my one question would be actually more to do with the humanitarian aid uh, agencies with whom you, you have um, been working because I'm very interested to hear um, about their re response to your engagement and whether they are prepared to do the kind of self-reflexive work, which I know you favor, um, and uh, to, to put themselves out of the picture and, and focus on the kinds of methodologies which you are promoting and how mm -hmm. that all went down or continues. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's excellent. That's an excellent question, Joe. Uh, I didn't want to invite them today, but there was no time to advertise. Um, I was just trying to retrieve the 
uh, emergency response sheet they shared with me, uh, just to see who the partners are and uh, to be a bit more, to concretize a bit my, my, my uh, discourse. So there, there are the bolsas, as I said, uh, CARE, ERD, um, MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, IRC, International Rescue Committee, IOM, Ethiopian Red Cross, ERDA. Um, there are the UN agencies, as I said, UNFPA, uh, UNHCR. Uh, I'm not sure if UN women are involved. I haven't seen that. Concern, uh, imagine... Um, Imagine one future. I, think, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, uh, I1D. Uh, it's not, uh, it, the initials are I1D, ACF, and a few others. Um, but on top of these, so the more international or, or prominent, not just international, there are also national organizations and prominent organizations. There are also multiple small organizations and um, uh, initiatives. In, in Tigray, so already social workers who are working on domestic violence or women's issues are now mobilized, you know, against the current sexual violence. Um, so there's a lot of local actors uh, and regional actors who work currently on the response, as I understand, um, and who are, you know, are key because it's not the UN agencies that provide the humanitarian, um, you know, um, support, but they coordinate. They coordinate all the partners to try and avoid duplication and achieve you know, a more integrated response, essentially. So when a new international, a new organization comes into the picture and wants to support the, the humanitarian response, the AORs, the areas of responsibility GBV and child protection were as integrated within the larger response and we avoid activeness. Did um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. I, I am in conversation with the GBV uh, AOR coordinator, uh, and uh, she has been very responsive to my comments and you know uh, the evidence I have shared so far and the working papers. I think in the, in the we raise multiple questions that the responses are research based. And they're not top down. They don't just follow, you know, UN guidelines that are formulated internationally and have nothing to do with the Tigray context. Uh, we asked how we can integrate research, uh, you know, and ethnographic approaches in particular. They're very interested. They said they're very interested in exploring these options and how we can collect more qualitative data. This is a comment I made because most of the data we have is quantitative around IDPs in particular and uh, provision of services. How many? You know how many agents are available and what kind of agents and so on but there's very little qualitative data um so i have made those comments i think other other people raised some similar comments and they were well received uh, we have to wait and see how how they will respond but um you know i, I think they as i said the humanitarian sector you know has been very much embedded in in a certain practice in a mainstream practice it's not going to change in the, in the current crisis uh, Joe, to be honest with you, they are very much constrained, you know, they follow the donors' priorities and agendas, again, they rely on funds, um, they also work with the government, so they are constrained, you know, they, they have to essentially follow government guidelines and, bureauc and bureaucratic processes, um, so I don't know what is what they are able to do, you know, how much space, how much liberty they have to really shape their interventions, because they're very much constrained, especially now with the limited access to the region, as we know. Um, but I am pushing for more research and integrating research within the current responses uh, and, and, and bringing, you know, researchers and rigor, rigorous scholars, um, uh, you know, integrating essentially the the research component with the current intervention as opposed to seeing it as something that comes in the aftermath, uh, you know, uh, or, or um, uh, as an add-on element. Actually, we are looking at ways to integrate research in the design of the intervention itself. The, the problem here is always the time because it's one has to respond urgently, you know, it's an emergency context. Uh, context. 
uh, I think research becomes secondary in people's minds. Um, and again, I, I keep talking about research because in order to understand how to engage the different community stakeholders effectively, you first need that evidence collection, right? And qualitative accounts and ethnographic um, testimonies. And the other thing I, I noticed is that the majority of people working in the meetings, uh, you know, are, are foreign people, foreigners. So of course, there are two great, two great partners. But I also wonder how many of these INGO staff who work on the ground speak Tigrinya. That's my that's my next question. It's something that I'm really interested in knowing. And again, I have pushed them. Uh, I always say, you know, to, to leverage on our knowledge because we do. Um, you know, my partners speak Tigrinya. I speak quite good Tigrinya uh, since my research to leverage on this opportunity of, of you know, our, our bilingual ability uh, in order to understand and communicate with the people and not just rely on translators who might, again, translation is just such a, a problematic practice. Um, so, so yes, I think there's a lot of uh, a room for them to become more reflexive, but I don't know if they have the ability, the time and the encouragement from the current conditions on the ground to do so. So I try to play the, the role, you know, I'm, try, I'm trying to be that voice that sort of reminds them that this, this is something we should be doing. I don't know how effective it is and how annoying I am, but I am trying to, to be that perspective, you know, good that luck, might not good be. Good luck, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> we need more people like you, <laughs> Romina. That's um, because, um, you know, it's um, uh, what you say about language is so important because, uh, of course, you know, you, you think with a little Google machine, you can you can translate absolutely everything, but that's not the case. And then also, if you want to open up the hearts of people, you need to uh, need, you need to be able to at least uh, uh, speak the emotional language. And that's often linked to the um, vernacular, uh, you know, languages that you speak. Absolutely. And, and just, you know, uh, recently we were having this discussion with Tegis, I can't remember the Apologies, the director of ERCMEAD, which is a, um, an organization in that provides psychological counseling and support. And they were just discussing the fact that there isn't a specific term for trauma in Amharic. Uh -huh. uh, my knowledge must be similar in Tigrinya. It's not a word I have come across, but if anybody ever used a word for trauma in Tigrinya, yeah. uh, anyone of our attendees is free to speak. Uh, but in Amharic, there's no specific term for trauma. And even discussing it, how do you accept trauma when you need to paraphrase it? And when you paraphrase it, you know, then you need a speaker who can understand the connotation of the different words of using to express your situation. And that means you need to be embedded in the people's worldview and cultural context yes. and work choice. So it's not just a linguistic translation, it's a cosmological translation, which I discussed in my book. You need to be able to translate across cultures and experience. You cannot do that unless you are deeply in the context and you know the history as well. It's not just you come uh, for a few weeks if you're a fluent speaker. If you're, even if you are a not a teacher who comes from into Tigray, you know, if you haven't lived in the context of the country, right, there might, be, there might be things you will miss, you'll miss out on because you don't understand the issues of the language and experience of the people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant explanation. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm, a, I'm aware that time is running away and I've, yes. <laughs> I will also have to uh, uh, switch over quite soon, actually leave and um, meet people, meet students, um, one student <laughs> outside. So I, yes. Any I more see. questions? Any Your, further questions? Uh, I see Your left, but he did make a comment um, on violence. I think consider the different media landscape we live in now. Mm -hmm. But from the era of the Red Terror and previous wars, we do have reports of very strong violence. Indeed, there was strong violence in the in the Red Terror committed by the state uh, parties. I, I'm uh, to the to the extent that I'm aware. But I was really in particular. Um, this is something different. I would strongly suspect that sexual violence is as well. This might be for decades. And I think this is an important point. I know Nick, who is conducting uh, research on terror violence, 
it's something we need more evidence on and more documentation as well. I think this is, you know, this is really more research understanding the, the, the history of war in Ethiopia. Um, there has been a lot written about the politics and, uh, you know, the, 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 the political change and mobilization of the public. Have documented domestic forms of violence. You have a lot of literature in other countries, um, but to my knowledge and experience, considerably less in Ethiopia. Again, I'm not, I'm not a specialist. I'm not aware of the literature. Of Ethiopia. I have read it, uh, but I think it has received much less attention. The forms of violence in previous uh, conflicts as opposed to other African countries that I have been exposed to. Just a comment. Um, if anyone is more familiar and experienced and knowledgeable, please and add to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any more questions? So I think- oh, uh, it, Yes, we have. Erica. Here's a question in the chat. Let me see. Uh, some is the trauma is new, yes, exactly. Uh, I don't know who the United European uh, sorry, oh, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, yes, but but in any case, um, yes, I, I mean, it's uh, one of the topics that I discuss in the context of Chinese history, <laughs> and it's um, speaking across um, civilizations. The term trauma to translate that is 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 tricky <laughs> because you end up it's not just psychological it's um, also connected to um, elements such as um, uh, now I can't think in English um, uh, not honor but um, shame that's it <laughs> yes uh, so this is how you overcome shame uh, wh whether it's a personal whether it's a collective um, you know whether you bring shame to the whole community by by being the victim. Yeah. And also, it's not that shame is not located in the moment of the terror, particularly with gender based violence, because there are repercussions like pregnancy and then the birth, and then you raise that child. So the shame is faced over and over and over again. And I've done a lot of work um, of my own bat into the narratives around Somali. Um, women and experience of, of this in the diaspora in America, America. Italy and in uh, Britain, there is part of Britain and that aspect of actually how, how does the family cope with the shame and the, the woman involved, just like the singular woman with an A, she's mm -hmm. part of a community that then is constantly dealing with her and the lived continued repercussion mm -hmm. of that who in its own self is an autonomous individual you're absolutely right joe it's extremely difficult i it, it blows my mind i have thought yeah. about it the study i cited from northern uganda a brilliant study on paper uh spoke about the not just the ex-combatant Times, uh, but also females who had been victims and had given birth to children uh, as a result. And those children were called children uh, and were not generally by society. And so they had to be also to protect their children right? because children weren't accepted. And, and again, this is a patriarchal society where women are uh, relying on a male breadwinner. Uh, if they have children who uh, were they will be alive, or if they marry, they may be abused by the husband because he's not accepted. So there are so many implications uh, that we we'll really need to think about. And the reason we wrote the paper and three pages, we cite all the studies in detail. So please we didn't have a chance to have comments, Joe. Um, it shows that we really start thinking collectively of how can we be of help to the Tigrayan, the victims in Tigrayan, uh, because it will have tremendous consequences, especially if I, I would say thinking of the religious cultural framework, how can we support this holistically, uh, given that they are, women already face multiple challenges in the society due to the patriarchal and the fact that 
don't don't have formal income, right? Especially yeah. in the countryside. So yeah. th there's huge implications, and, and our hope is our aim really is to be proactive and about that, not, not just, just the immediate uh, uh, need that is absolutely urgent, but thinking two and three steps ahead of time. Um, we need to come together as a country, as I say, being in Ethiopia um, and as an international community working on Ethiopian studies and, and really put our minds together and the humanitarian sector to, to help each other and, and produce an integrated that, that responds to the psycho, you know, provide psychosocial support immediately to the victims currently, the witnesses as well have a lot of trauma uh, and cannot have no closure perhaps, they have seen people the closure and also let us consider that oftentimes it's due to the way of fighting and intentionally the militant elements allow people to bury the dead which is so important in the, in the country, right to have a proper burial um so people have no closure um, so we have to think and have to think how can we respond uh, to the complex bringing all the community stakeholders and this is really what as 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 and and I, I, I think as well, we, can, we can advocate for that. That's the least we can do. We cannot do much, much but it's something we're um, advocating for currently. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Romina. Thank you, Joe. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, I think I'll wrap up. No. Thank you so much, all. Oh, it was lovely to it was very nice to have you with us <laughs> and yes take good care of yourself and then um um yes well in you never know <laughs> and then um we are looking forward to having you back here in person <laughs> and uh, at some point we might be able to run uh, proper live um, seminars again yes thank you very much thank you for everyone for coming at such short notice but i i didn't want to um you know, announce it too long in advance because you know, um, you never know what the situation is like. And and you did a brilliant job, uh, Rumina, for, for uh, presenting the topic and also your your own personal engagement in this research. Thank you. And the, the technology mostly worked. Zoom was a bit slow, yes, and the internet was sure. also a bit slow. Yes. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I apologize for unintended uh, errors. This is just, as I said, I'm speaking from my experience as an individual. Um, I'm doing my best, but I don't have only science. Um, I think we just have to have a community, understand that mistakes, try to navigate the landscape, uh, hold grudges, and work together. That is the message I have to share. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs> Celebrating the Holy Week. I uh, have a blessed Holy Week. Yes, it's a Holy Week, of course, in the Orthodox uh, world. Yes, Eastern Orthodox. Yes, and Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox as well. well so Holy uh, Week now, uh, and uh, yes, Easter coming up. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.